بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. How are you all? Is this mic? You can hear me, right? I don't need to put it up. Okay. I don't know which one is which anymore. خيرا. It's a pleasure to be with you guys. الحمد لله رب العالمين. This is actually my first trip since March 2020. March 1st, 2020. I went home from California and I had initially planned to take a month off in, the, in, in March 2020 anyway because Ramadan was coming in April and I knew I was going to be very busy and I had been traveling so much in 2018, 2019, I was tired. So I told my wife, you know, like March, we're going to take the month off, uh, spend some time with family, get some of my other side businesses that I run focused again because they're dying and then I'll get back on the road in April inshallah ta'ala. That uh, that month turned into 18 very quickly. Uh, that two weeks to flatten the curve turned into 18 months and a whole bunch of stuff that I have to do to be able to travel now. But alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure to spend my first trip with you guys. Uh, I know I've been here a couple of times, um, but hopefully, inshallah, it's still of a means of benefit anyway. Um, as the brother was saying, uh, during the pandemic, I took a lot of what I was doing online and uh, kind of a rebirth of the da'wah that I do to have a more holistic approach, especially to our youth, because our youth, I believe, are not only the most important part of our community, but they are the most underserviced part of our community as well. Um, we are losing them by the truckload, and, and there's a lot of efforts that need to be made because our youth, subhanAllah, that, that especially the youth of... of the West, who are mostly the children of immigrants, who are now first generation Muslims born and raised in this society, are going to share a huge, huge burden of carrying the deen forward and, and bridging the gap between the older generation and the, the indigenous populations that we find in the West. And it is so critical for our youth to have the identity of a Muslim while being allowed to live in the reality of the world they live in right now and know how to balance that. I think that is one of the most underserviced areas of our community that I have seen over the past 15 years of traveling the globe. So I decided to spend a lot of my time in the pandemic designing programs, designing initiatives to focus on our youth, to bring them back to the, the fold of being a proudly practicing Muslim while also allowing them to be humans and allowing them to grow and make mistakes and enjoy their life and hobbies and etc within the bounds of the Sharia insha'Allah ta'ala. I'm not going to rant about that anymore. But the whole point of that was to say that why I chose Islam is why I chose to share Islam with the world. The reason I do da'wah is the exact same reason that I chose to become a Muslim in 1998 because I found in it the answers to questions I had been searching for my entire life. And not only did I find the answers, I found proof of the answers. This is the thing that has always been missing from my journey. For any of you, those of you who saw my story about how the Bible led me to Islam, I, I, when I left Christianity, it was because of the fragility of the proofs that were put forward. You know, it was because of the fragility of the proofs of the Bible and the fragility of the proofs of, of you know, the Holy Spirit and all of these things that caused me to leave Christianity. And my one condition going forward, when I started to look into Judaism, when I started to look into Hinduism, when I started to look into Buddhism and, and all of the other isms and, 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 and uh, religions out there, was I wanted proof. I remember my grandfather telling me growing up that the truth always comes with proof. So if someone says they're telling you the truth, ask them for the proof. And that was my litmus test going forward when I studied Judaism. Hindu. I wanted proof. I don't, I don't want this, you just tell me something that makes me feel good because that's what I spent the majority of my life being told in church. I wanted proof, tangible evidence, because if what you say you believe is from the creator of the heavens and earth, untampered with, unadulterated, all of those things, then there will be tangible proof of it. There has to be, because the world is tangible proof of the existence of the creator, right? The universe is tangible proof. There are so many things around us 
And even the Quran tells us to look inside of our own soul, our own bodies. I mean, just look at us. We are living proof of the existence of a design and a creator. So if he has a way of life for mankind, that way of life for mankind must have some proof behind it. And it must be proof that is equivalent with the creator who sent it. That means that proof would be perfect. Because the nature of the creator is that he is perfect, right? You wouldn't go to anyone who believes in God. Most uh, well, uh, Today you'll find many weird things. Let me, let me backtrack. You will not go to most people who say they believe in God and not say that he is perfect. Even those who believe that God created and, and separated himself, meaning that he just created things like agnostics and, and deists, and he does not, you know, take care what the way, just lets it go. He set it in motion like a top spinning, and it's just going to go where it goes. Even they will say that it was perfect. It is only us who destroy things. So if God is perfect, if the creator is perfect, his religion would be perfect. The proofs that came with it would be perfect. Everything about it would just fall right into place. And I could not find that in the other religions because they're man-made. They're man-made. And the evidence of that is the proofs, the documents, the writings, the books, all have mistakes. They all have discrepancies. They all have contradictions. Why? Because the nature of man is that just like if God created something, it would be perfect. When man tries to create something, it carries with it the imperfections of, of being insane, of being human beings and our flawed nature. So, as you know, for those of you who have not seen my story, you'll get little pieces of it. I left religion altogether. After doing these studies, which didn't take long, because as soon as I would, because I would go to look at documents of books, I would go to look, okay, let's look at the, the Vedas, let's look at the Bhagavad Gita, let's look at the, you know, the, the, the Hindu texts and things of this nature. The moment I found something to be contradictory, a mistake, problematic, I walked away. I walked away because if it is automatically, if there's a mistake, this can't be from God. Parts of it might be just like we as Muslims now believe that parts of the, the, the Bible Christians read today could very well be the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we don't, we don't know for sure because we have nothing to prove it. So I left religion because when I read about Islam, uh, I don't want you know, anybody to think that I didn't come across Islam. I did. There was a book that said that Muslims worship the moon god who lived in a, de in, a, in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia and that the greatest deed an, a Muslim could do was to kill a non-Muslim and he would get virgins when he went to heaven. I, I didn't need to know anything else. You know, that was it. Now, whatever, whatever religion is based off of that, I'm all good. And I've never seen a Muslim anyway in South Carolina in 1998. I'm like, I'm straight. There's no Muslims. Coming to find out that I actually was born and raised across the street from a masjid <laughs> my whole life and I never knew it. But... When I was able to go to the masjid for the first time in 1998 and the Imam gave a very beautiful khutbah, it, it touched me, mashallah. But when I went to him after the salah and, and, and asked him, because he started telling me about Islam, you know how our da'wah goes, you know, Islam is built on five pillars and six, uh, six beliefs. And I said, look, I just want to know, do you have some proof? I said, can you show me the proof, you know, like show me the money, you know, like where, where, where is the proof that your religion is what you say it is? And he smiled. He's like, you know, he said, I got you. So he went and pulled a book off the shelf and he handed it to me. And my first proof handed to me about the deen of Al-Islam was the Quran. He said, this is it. This is our proof. And then he started to tell me about the Quran, you know, that it was revealed to the Prophet. I said, look, no, 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 no. I've already had people try to pre-sale me. You know, he's already trying, he's like, he's trying to load me up to go read this Quran with a certain frame of mind. I said, no, 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 don't do that. L let me read this book. If it is what you say it is, it'll prove itself. This was, this was the amount of, of, of certainty that I had that if God had a religion, it would be clear, crystal, for someone who was searching. So I took the Quran home, and that was on a Friday evening, and I started reading it. And I remember reading Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, well, first I remember reading it and realizing that the book was backwards. Because I was given one of those blue noble Qur'ans from Saudi. And I opened it and I'm like, I'm in the index. I'm, in the, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I realized they had to flip it over or to read it the other way. So I opened the Qur'an and I read Surah Al-Fatiha. All praise belongs 
to Allah who is the Lord of all the worlds, the most gracious, the most merciful, the master of the day of judgment. You alone do we worship and you alone do we seek our assistance. Guide us to the straight path. The path of those who have earned your favor, not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor of those who have gone astray. As soon as I read that, Jesus' prayer that he taught his disciples in the Bible came to mind. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and, and lead us, uh, you know, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And there was such glaring similarities. Like when I watched the message for the first time, and, and when King Najashi said that what you have said and what we have is like two rays from the same lamp, that was the feeling that I got reading Surah Al-Fatiha. And then I turned over to Surah Al-Baqarah. And the first verse, Matt, had no meaning to me whatsoever. ALM. The second verse is the reason I decided to look into Islam. It's the reason I decided to keep reading the Quran. It could very well be the reason I'm a Muslim today. It's Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 2. This is the book. Subhanallah. If you understood how deep just that phrase alone. This is the book. And it's, and it's in such a, a, a powerful prose that Allah Jalla wa Ala is telling mankind. There is no hesitation in this statement. This is the book. In it is no doubt. No crookedness. No strangeness. It's clear. And it will guide whomsoever fears the one who created them. And it will guide whomsoever has fear or has taqwa or has consciousness of their God. To me, initially, that challenge made me angry because I did not want to believe that Muslims could have any, even though this Imam gave a khutbah that day that was so beautiful about the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it touched me. There was no way I wanted to admit that, that Muslims, whom I used to believe as a Christian, would, would, would be the Dajjal. I believe that the, the, the Mahdi that we wait on now was going to be the Dajjal. You know, and, and that Muslims are going to be the army of Ad Dajjal. That's what I believed about you guys. That's what I heard and that's what I just, it sounded good and clicked together and there we go. That's the Antichrist. I did not want to believe that there's no way I've been looking all over for God and I'm going to find him with the Muslims. You know, like this, I have to figure out a way to disprove this book. But this book, Allah Jalla wa Ala, is wisdom. Made sure that that verse would be the first thing you read after Fatiha. This is the book, there is no ghayb in it. There's no doubt in it, there's no crookedness, there's no errors, there's no contradiction, there's nothing. And it will guide whomsoever has fear of me. So I started to read Surah Al-Baqarah with the intention that I'm going to find that thing that can tell me that Islam is wrong. That this book is not what it says it is. And so I keep reading in Baqarah and I come across another challenge. That if you have any doubt about this book, bring something like it. And call anyone you wish to help you. And when you fail, and you will fail. If and when you fail, you're going to fail trying to replicate this book. Then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones. And then I find another challenge. Had this been from any other than God, you would find in it contradictions. So very early on, the Quran is challenging me intellectually to discredit it. No other religious book on the face of the planet Earth has this challenge. Because it would be very problematic. And if that challenge was there, you better believe scribes would have taken it out at some point. Because they played around with the texts. And then the book starts telling me about the family of Ali Imran, which starts talking about people I remember. I start reading about you know, I start reading about Ibrahim, I start reading about Musa, I start reading about Dawood, I start and then I get to the stories of Jesus, and I'm like. Where has this been all this time? That pureness that I was looking for from the lives of the Anbiya, from the Prophet's lives, that they were the best of us, that they were an example to be looked up to and to be followed, and they were sent by God to guide mankind to how we should live our lives and put a standard in place that was missing from the Bible, that was missing from everything else. I'm now finding it in the Quran. 
that these men were exemplars. They were the best of us. They were paragons of piety and virtue. Something that we could, as feeble humans, look up to and try to aspire to be. Not people who had been taken and torn down to the level of us, who were, in some cases in the Bible, the worst of us, you know, to make ourselves feel better. That's not what I was looking for. I wanted, there's got to be an example. And so I finished the Quran in three days. I couldn't put it down. I couldn't. Um, I was I was addictive and I am somewhat of a, a speed reader in English because you know And there was a lot of things in the Quran that I kind of glazed over because they don't make any sense to me as a non-muslim A lot of the rulings that I came and I'm just like, yo, I'm just I'm looking for more of these stories and then I'm reading about the stories of Paradise and the stories of the hellfire and then I get to the end of the Quran starting in like chapter 71 72 73 and the horrors of the day of judgment are being put forward and even in the English language, which is a travesty from, from, from the Arabi, it's, it's, a, it's, a trans, it's not a translation, it's a, it's, a, it's a commentary at its very best and, and feeblest attempt. Because you can't translate uh, uh, Semitic languages, they don't, there's no verbatim translation, and if you do translate it verbatim, it makes very little sense um, in English. But by the time I had finished the Qur'an, all I could do was get down on my hands and knees like I had done previously. Before, before I ended up leaving faith altogether, I had gotten down on my hands and knees in my, in my room alone and said, God, look, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm extremely confused. If you want me to know the truth, you're going to have to help me out. And here I am a couple you know, years later, getting back down on my hands and knees and saying, you know, my, my Lord who created me, I, 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 in a million years, I would have never to have expected to find you in a book possessed by Muslims. But I said I wanted guidance, and here I am. If you want me to be a Muslim, I'll be a Muslim. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's it. I'm, this, 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 this had touched me. And I used to think that maybe I had done something, you know, reading it, giving it some diligence. Blah. 50,000 years before Allah Jalla decided to create anything, he had already written in a book with himself that I would be guided to Islam on this day and this year at this place. It was chosen for me before I existed. So I just have to say Alhamdulillah for that and live, try to live a life to do as much gratitude to the one who created me for, for giving me that guidance because I was lost. So I went back to the masjid and um, I told the Imam I wanted to be a Muslim and he was like, you've been only been gone for three days. I said, yes, because your book is what you say it is. I read it. He was like, so you believe there's only one God? I said, I've always believed there was only one God. I was just extremely confused with the whole Trinity. Paul had me like way out there in some no man's land. Nobody understands it. Even Christians will tell you today, that I'm, and I'm not saying this is an insult, it's called the great mystery. God is a great mystery of the Trinity. You have no idea. You're not supposed to know who he is. So I said, yes, I believe there's only one God. He said, that's good. You also have to believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I have a few books about the Prophet Muhammad, if you would like to. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I have one question for you about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You answer this question, I need to know what I need to know about him. He said, what is that? I said, did he give us this book? I said, is he the one who delivered the Quran to us. He said, yes. I said, then he is who he says he is. Simple as that, cut and dry. If the book is truth, then the messenger who conveyed it is truth. I'll be a Muslim. So I took my shahada uh, then, but I took it again the following Friday in, in December of 1998 and, and started my journey of becoming a Muslim and getting involved in what is known as da'wah, apostolization, and, and sharing the message of Islam around the world. But why I chose Islam is because not only could I establish a relationship with the one who created me, but I had proof to back it up. And that's a, that's a super, super, super solid feeling. Super solid feeling when you, when you can say something and you know with no doubt, no hesitation that it's actual facts, it's, it's, that's where you gain honor, dignity. That's where you don't mind telling it to anyone because I can, I can back it up. You know how we are, how our children are? I have three, mashallah. 
if, if they told you they've done something, they haven't really done it, and you ask them, okay, well, show me, and then they're kind of scurrying around. They're like, yeah, they're hiding in the corners. But if they've cleaned their room and they know it's clean, they're coming and standing in front of you like, come look, look, I cleaned my room. <laughs> the one time a month that you do it, because they know they have something to back it up with. That's the honor that, that, that Islam gave me to be able to tell other people about it when I knew that it was the immutable truth. The immutable truth. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, the Quran is the foundational basis for that truth and that religion. It's the one thing that cannot be challenged. Muslims can be challenged because we are people. We are humans. We do all kinds of things. We are not the best exemplars of, of, of Islam all the time. You know how a lot of people say, you know, look at Islam, not at the Muslims. We, we are not perfect people. But that Quran... The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is immutable. It is a miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not only the proof of our Islam, it is the proof of prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that every prophet was sent with proof to, to prove to their people whom they were. Many prophets were sent with miracles, all kinds of miracles. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did miracles as well, but he said the proof that Allah sent me with is the Qur'an. That is the proof that Allah sent to me with. It is the one miraculous book that until the Muslims decide to drop it from their hearts, it can never be eradicated off the face of this earth. Never be eradicated. I remember I watched part of a movie. I was on a plane one time and there was this movie called Eli. I don't know if anybody ever seen this book. It's a movie. It's a Denzel Washington movie. But anyway, it was, you know, the, the apocalypse times had come and, and Eli was blind, but, you know, he was trying to preserve the last copy of the Bible. He had memorized it because all the other books had been destroyed. And there was this one place in San Francisco where like, they were collecting anyone who had copies of books, bring it to us so we can preserve it. And he had to memorize it. And, 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 and it was such a, the whole movie was about him trying to preserve the Bible and get it to this place because he was the last person on earth who had it. And I'm thinking, you know, like the Quran would have been the first book they would have put in that thing because you could destroy every copy of the Quran today and we would have millions back in print tomorrow afternoon. Subhanallah. But how many hufaz that we have and it would be checked and triple checked and quadruple checked. There would not be a mistake that come out of it. Name any other book on the face of the planet Earth that has this miraculous nature. That if you destroyed every living existing copy tomorrow, they could reproduce it like that. Subhanallah. And to me, that has been always a proof for me that, that I've fallen in love with over and over and over and over again. When I first started to research into the Quran and how it was revealed, because there are unfortunately, I'm just going to mention this as a side note. There has been, you know, a, a, a very collected effort, uh, um, um, you know, against the, the Quran and things of that nature by Orientalists, etc. And, they, and, and, they've, and they've all failed. And once I decided to look into the Quran, the method of its revelation, the method of its compilation, the method of, of how we know what was said is actually what was said. It's, it's such a beautiful thing that we can sit down. The teacher that I have in, in Minneapolis, alhamdulillah, his name is Sheikh Walid Idris uh, Al-Manisi, Hafidullah Ta'ala, who knows all ten kira'ah, along with four, the, four un, like the four irregular ones, and all the way with beautiful chains back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the words he's reciting to me, he can quote it by saying, I heard from so-and-so who heard from so-and-so who heard from so-and-so who, so -so who heard from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah says this. The beauty of this, that we can trace back and say, I know that when I read, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, that my Rabb said this because I can tell you every single person who heard it from him, who heard it from them, we know their life, we know their example, we know who they were, we know who their family were, we know about their piety, we know about their uprightness. It is such a beautiful thing to have this, this kind of honor. But another reason why I'm so happy that I chose Islam is because the relationship that a Muslim has with their creator is the relationship that he wants them to have with him. Let me, let me re-emphasize that so you understand where I'm heading with this. The relationship that a Muslim has with the one who created them is the relationship that he wants them to have with him.
Whereas with every other world religion, it's the relationship that the creation want to have with the creator. They have decided how their relationship with the creator will be. And they have based their religion upon that. So they have designed the way that they're going to interact with the one who created them. And that never made a lot of sense to me. That never made a lot of sense to me. That's like handing someone, you know, a, a brand new technology that no one has ever used before and giving no instruction manual with it. Just figure it out. Just figure it out. Yeah, you, you, you'll, you'll get it eventually. Just keep pushing buttons. Eventually something's going to work. And then if that doesn't try another combination and just keep fixing it and working it. I said, if the creator, if our creator created us and he wants us to worship him, and that's his desire for us to worship him, then he must tell us how to worship him. It's only logical justice that how could he punish us for worshiping him improperly if he did not give us the right way to do so. And that was clear cut and evident. This is the beauty of Islam, is that it simplifies for us, Alhamdulillah, the relationship that we have with the creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That number one, if you know nothing else, base that relationship upon Tawheed. If you know nothing else, base that relationship upon Tawheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and never let that go. Even if you lose everything else, never let go of that relationship upon Tawheed. The Prophet sallallahu said at the end of time, there would be people who would be around, but they would not pray. They would not fast. They would not give charity. They would not even recite the Quran because it would not have existed on earth anymore. Hajj will have been abandoned. Umrah will have been abandoned. Mecca is abandoned. Medina is abandoned. Wild animals run through my masjid and urinate on my mimbar. He said all of this. He said, the only thing that will be left with those people towards the end of time is the statement, La ilaha illallah. And the companions asked the Prophet Sallallahu what good is that statement going to do them? With no salah, no zakah, no, no nothing else. He said it will take them to paradise. The weight of that statement will take them to paradise because the generations before them are the ones who abandoned the salah and it got, it got to this point. But those people, because of their just holding on to this tawheed, they will go to paradise. And then the Prophet ﷺ said a man on the day of judgment will be brought who had done so many sins that he will have 99 huge scrolls like you know we're talking big gigantic wheels of of of, of written sins 99 of them he will have and he's standing there on the day of judgment waiting to be because every the mizan is out every one of us will have the weighing of the mizan no one is going to be free from that your good deeds will be put on one side your bad deeds will put be put on the other side and according to the weight of them to be tipped allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his judgment so this man is just sitting there waiting to be thrown into Jahannam. He has no, I don't have anything. I have 99 scrolls of bad deeds. It's over. I might as well just go and, you know, chuck myself in. No. But as they are bringing his scrolls up to place them on the scale, the Prophet ﷺ said that a card will fall out. A little card will fall out and hit the ground. And they will pick up that card. And on that card will be written the statement, La ilaha illallah. That's it. That's all he's got. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, put the scrolls on the bad side and put that card on his good deeds. And he's thinking to himself, you know, what's, what's this card going to do? It has no weight to it. So they place the bad deeds on the side and the scale tips heavy on that side. And they place the card on the good side and slowly the balances tip and then they tilt in his favor. And Allah tells him, because of your firmness, Upon that statement, he may, we don't know the conditions of the man. He might have been raised in a very hard and rough time, surrounded by so much fitness, so much oppression, and we don't know what he might have went through. But he never let go of la ilaha illallah. So because of that, Allah sends him to paradise. So first and foremost, the reason why I chose Islam is because that tawheed is so pure. It's so simple. That I can even explain it to my, I've explained it to all my children from a very young age that there's one God and there's nothing else like Him. Okay, that's very simple. It's simple to understand. And as long as we can hold on to that, not only does it guarantee us entry into paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said there's not a single person who dies that has even the, the amount of faith in their heart, the 
size of a mustard seed of Tawheed, but they, all, they will go to paradise. They will go to paradise. So not only does it guarantee our entry into paradise, but it gives us the foundation upon which we can establish a relationship with the Creator. That everything we do with regards to the relationship of the Creator has to be regulated upon Tawheed. If it violates any principle of Tawheed in the slightest, it is not worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as innovation. It's a very simple litman test to what we should do and what we should not do. If it violates any principle of Tawheed in any way, shape, form or fashion, we get rid of it. It's gone. It's out the door. But not only that, but you get to have an in-depth personal relationship with the one who created you, but it's based upon his design. Like a lot of religions focus on, you know, the personal relationship with the creator. Like Christianity went so far, Paul went so far as to make the personal relationship with the creator supreme and toss out all the rules. Just whatever relationship you have with God, that's your personal relationship with him. And, and, and that's good. That's fine. That's okay. That's why there's so many different variations and branches, etc. But when you stick upon Tawheed, you develop a personal relationship with the Creator in the sense that number one, you understand that He is He and He alone and every act of worship should be directed to, towards Him. This is what is known as Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, that Allah is the only ilah, therefore He deserves the right to be worshipped. For instance, let's just take this little Zoom recorder right here. Can this be an ilah? Yes or no? Can I make this an ilah? Yes, I can. The word ilah means anything that's given worship. Anything that you worship, that you believe has some supernatural abilities to bring you harm or do good for you, it is considered ilah. This ball of water can be an ilah. Many things are made ilah. The cross is made an ilah. Jesus is made an ilah. Buddha is made an ilah. They make so many, so many. The Meccans had what, over 360 different gods in the Kaaba, but they can never be Allah. It can never be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we say Allah, we are saying the only ilah. La ilaha, there is no ilah illallah, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else is false worship. So we establish that uluhiyya with Allah jalla wa'ala. That we are giving him his rights. That is due upon him. And do you know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He told Mu'ad ibn Jabal. He said, Ya Mu'ad, do you know what the right of Allah is upon his slaves? He said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, uh, Allah wa Rasulullah alam. Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, The right of Allah upon His slaves is that they worship Him with, with Tawheed, the way He created them to. I did not create mankind and jinn, illa li ya'budun, but they worship me. And then He said, Ya Mu'adh, do you know what the right that Allah, no, that the slave has upon Allah? And Ya Mu'adh said, I don't know. Allah and His Messenger know best. What right can we have on Allah? He created us, He gives us everything. What right could we have on Him? He said, Allah has given his slave the right upon him that if he worship, if they worship him with Tawheed, he will not punish them. He will not punish them. SubhanAllah. That, that is how Puritan Islam is with monotheism. There is no monotheistic religion on the face of the earth like Islam. The purest form of worshipping one God. And then with Tawheed al rububiyyah it gives comfort and, cons and, 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 and console to the soul and heart. Why? Because when you study rububiyyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you really concept in your mind that Allah is Rabb, and what that means, you stop worrying. Because if Allah is Rabb, He's in control. When Allah introduces Himself in the Quran, what does He say? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. His first attribute He mentions to mankind is that He's Rabb. Because Rabb means that he controls everything. Upon all things, he is capable and powerful. That means if I eat today, it's because Allah is Rabb and he has fed me. If I breathe air, it's because Allah is Rabb and he has made it possible for me to do so. Why is the sky blue? There's a scientific reason, but it's because Allah is Rabb. The only thing scientists have figured out is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did it. Some of his process of creation. This is why I like studying science and physics. It gives you kind of some intimate understanding of the process which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates. Why is water wet? We're not going to have that discussion. Is water wet or not? <laughs> why, why does water have the properties of water? Because Allah is Rabb. Why is the earth balanced in its position? 
around the sun to where its entire orbit, it never goes too far away or too close to where human life cannot exist anymore because Allah is Rabb and He, and he holds it in that position. You, you can call it gravity, you can call it whatever you want to call it. This is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you understand that, brothers and sisters, you stop worrying over the mundane. Things that are outside of your control, you let it go. Because you realize, if it's outside of my control, if there's not something I can physically do about it right now, then it's in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands and He's Rabb. It will be what He wants it to be. That is what is known as having sakina, tranquility. You're not stressed anymore about things. And, and things that used to bug you, you learn one of the ways, anybody who's watched my, my stuff over the past 18 months know that I have started to reveal a lot about my personal life that I felt was of a benefit now that I've been at this da'wah for a very long time. And, and that I suffered from anxiety, from, from childhood trauma, I suffered from panic attacks. Studying the rububiyya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped me get over all of it. Because anxiety is an excess worry that becomes uncontrollable, that leads to panic, it leads to you feel like the world is crumbling down, the angel of death is coming for you. But when you learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabb, you learn to let it go. I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. So the rububi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is a proof of the religion of Islam. And then to take that worship a little bit further, because this is why one of the proofs that I, why I accepted Islam, because it's, it's so scientific and codified. I don't have to go and try to figure anything out. It's all there for us in the Quran and in the Sunnah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in an authentic hadith, that halal is haram and haram, uh, halal is clear and haram is clear. I have left you on a straight path. Its day is like its night, distinguishable from one another. He said, there is nothing that would bring you closer to Allah, but I commanded you to do it already. There is nothing that would take you away from Allah, except that I have already forbidden it for you. So just stay on that straight path and, and follow it. He told us that I left you with everything. Everything that I could have given you, I gave to you. So stay upon that straight and clear path. When you understand the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when regards to his al-asma wal sifat, his names and his attributes, the attributes we will leave alone for a moment. The attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all we say about them is that we confirm them, we do not try to interpret them, and we say that they are not like the creation. Simple as that. And we, we kind of leave that there. Anything else, we're getting very esoteric, which takes very dangerous roads. But about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a difference between standing for salah, praying to Allah, knowing that He is your Rabb, that He created you, okay, then standing and praying salah in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that not only is your Rabb, He is as Samir. When you recite and you ask him, he's hearing you. He's listening to everything. He's listening to things that you say and things that you don't say. When you know that you're standing in front of Al-Basir, who sees you, who's watching you, who sees not only your physical form, but sees to the deepest depths of your heart that no one but you knows. When you are standing in front of Allah after having committed a, a sin or a misdeed and you know you're standing in front of Al-Ghafoor, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, Al-Wadud, al latif It gives you hope that these sins that you're pouring out to your Lord, He's going to take them and release you from them. That's a different level. When you are standing in, 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 in the streets and, and doing something you know you shouldn't be doing and then you remind yourself that Allah is, is, is Al-Basir, He is seeing, but also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the swift, He is the judge, He is the just. It takes your worship from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to being just, being from, from just um, ritual, ritual acts that we perform to actual ibadah. Ibadah, because you're doing it with a heart that is present. You're doing it with a mind that is present. You're doing it with a soul that is present and understands whom it's speaking to, understands whom it's communicating with, whom it's standing in front of. And there is no more beauty than that, brothers and sisters. No more beautiful relationship than the one that you have with the one who created you. 
No more beautiful relationship because no one in this life, your mother who gave you birth, your father who raised you, your, your wife or your husband who knows you in and out, no one knows you like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you. When you grasp that, you're quick to take things to him because you begun to realize that he already knows. He already knows. He already knows what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. He knows the outcome of my life. So there is no better communication I can have with this issue than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a wisdom that you'll find that Adam alayhi salam, when, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kicked him and Eve out of the garden, when they ate from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from. It's, uh, you'll find this in Tafsir Ibn Kathir of uh, Surah Al-Baqarah verse 30 and those few verses after it. That Adam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our father, our, the first of us, made such a beautiful decision right here. He said, my Lord, did you not create me with your own two hands? And Allah said, yes, I did. He said, did you not breathe into me the breath of life and cause me to live? He said, yes. He said, didn't when I sneeze, because the first thing when Adam became alive, he sneezed. And did you not say, Ya Allah, may Allah have mercy upon you? He said, yes, I did. Then Adam said, when you created me and my wife and placed us in this garden, and you told us not to eat from this tree, didn't you already know we were going to do it anyway? See the wisdom, the hukum of, of, of Adam alayhi salam? This, this is what made Adam so much greater than anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ever created because he was able to rationale this, this relationship that he had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, yes, I knew you were going to do it anyway. You see, Allah knew. Every sin, brother or sister, that you're ever going to commit in your life, Allah has already written it down and knows that you're going to do it. Knows you're going to do it. He said, so then can you not forgive me for that which you already knew I was going to do? And Allah said, yes. And then he taught them, say, my, my Lord, I have wronged my own soul. Because our, our misdeeds do no harm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot take anything, even if every human being on planet earth stopped worshipping Allah in sync right now. It would not detract from the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. It would not reduce his power whatsoever. He could erase all of us in an instant, like we never existed. The point of that relationship is what you're going to do with it. That sin nature that we have... As Muslims, we look at it very differently than Christianity does. Christianity looks at it as born into us, like every child is born with sin. This is why Catholics must be uh, baptized. If they believe even if a child is not baptized and it dies, it goes to hell because it dies with that sin nature. As Muslims, we believe that that sin nature is developed as we become mature. That we're not even responsible for any of that until we reach maturity. But that relationship is synonymous amongst every human being. Every human being that has ever walked the face of this earth, besides the Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cleaned them. They, all of us, have and will commit sin. Without that sin, the Prophet sallallahu said, if you do not commit sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would erase you. All, he would get rid of all of mankind as they are now, and he would recreate another species of people who would commit sins and then repent to him so he can forgive them. This is why I love Islam so much, because it puts huge emphasis on the relationship of the creator and the relationship with his flawed creation. A perfect creator and a flawed creation. This has always been a sticking point of many religions, is how to reconcile the perfect creator with flawed creation and how to link, how, how the two can ever meet up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us with the first of us that you're going to sin. It's part of who you are and I know you're going to do it. But those of you who turn back to me, my Lord, I have wronged my own soul. If you don't have mercy on me and forgive me, I'll surely be one of the losers. Then I can show my strongest power. Because yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so powerful in what he created. I mean, there are things out there in creation that, 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 that astronomers and, and physicists have discovered that will blow your mind. There are planets out there that are so dense that if you filled the dirt from one of them in, or the, the material from one of them in this cup, it would be too heavy for any human being or machinery to ever pick up. SubhanAllah. So Allah is powerful. And that is clearly seen. But true power, true power that gives Allah Jalla the right to be ilah, 
is that he creates human beings that he know is going to sin against him. But there are going to be those who turn around and ask him to forgive them. And even though he has the right to punish them still, one sin, Allah has every right. Our creator has every right to throw you into hell forever. And you could not complain because you were created to worship Allah. Anything that you do beyond that, he has the right to take his revenge. He created you, he feeds you, he gives you air, he makes your heart, like you're in debt every single day. But Allah Jalla says, if you turn to me and ask me to forgive you, he will forgive us. That is supreme power. When you have the right to punish, when you have every capability to punish, and yet you choose to forgive and be merciful and show leniency. This is the true power of the creator that we worship, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, we depend on that. Our very existence depends upon that mercy. Were he to cut off that mercy to mankind, even for a moment, we would all be doomed. We would all be doomed. He would stop our existence like this. Subhanallah. This is the relationship that gives supreme proof of the creator. And all of this, all of this to, to, to follow back full circle. Then I'll give you one little small thing and then we'll wrap it up and take some questions. Insha'Allah ta'ana. All of this circles back to around. So how do we know any of this? All of this that I just spent the past what, 30 minutes talking about. How do we know any of it? How do we know any of it? How did I know any of this that I just talked to you about? It goes right back to the Quran. It comes full circle. It comes full circle to all of these things come back to the Quran. Even when it comes to the Hadith. Because Allah told our Prophet وسلم, We have revealed the book to you so that you can explain it to them in that which they differ. And he told us, obey Allah and obey his messenger if you wish to obtain mercy, etc., so on and so forth. So it comes back full circle. That this Qur'an, this beautiful book that we have, this beautiful kalam Allah, gives us all of this depth and breadth of information of not only the existence of our Creator, but how He wants us to have a relationship with Him. The guidebook on how we should have a relationship with Him is in the Qur'an. And I, very easily, I'm going to make a fit 101 for all of uh, uh, our youth. I'm sure all of uh, us older when we know this, mashallah, you don't need nothing. You got this. But fit 101, when it comes to your dunya, especially for our youth, the default ruling of your life is that everything in this world is permissible in your daily life. Everything in this world is permissible unless you can find clear evidence from the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, that is impermissible. That's the default ruling. That is, that is clearly known by any basic level student of, 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 of Sharia and things of this nature and Asul of Fiqh. That the default ruling is that it's permissible. If there's no like, like saying, is it permissible to have one of these things? Well, if you can't prove that it's not permissible, it's permissible by default. Unfortunately, we as Muslims, we, we look for the impermissible. We try to make things impermissible. And the Prophet ﷺ actually told his companions not to do that. Do you know that? They kept asking him questions about, is this halal? He said, look, stop asking me these things. He actually told them, stop asking me halal and haram questions. Because if you ask me, I become obligated to tell you. And when I tell you, it becomes mandatory upon you. So stop asking. If Allah reveals something, alhamdulillah, if He doesn't, let it go. He even said about the siwak. He said, I would have told you to, to uh, use siwak before every salawat, except I am afraid that it would have become an obligation. Allah would have made it obligatory and the salah would have been made hard on you and difficult. So the, the default ruling of your life is things are permissible. Unless there's black and white clear evidence that they're not permissible. So we need to stop making our lives extra hard. By looking, you know, like uh, I've seen brothers in the grocery store, they're looking at ingredients and now they are Googling chemical components that are Googled to other chemical components. And they're like, I'm like, whoa, subhanAllah, this is rough. I mean, may Allah bless you for your intent to make sure that you intake nothing but halal. But you also don't, don't, don't tell anybody else to do this, bro. This is too much. This is beyond your capacity. Do I have any evidence for this? Yes. There were some new Muslims who had come to the Prophet Sallallahu and they had brought meat that they had slaughtered. And Aisha radiallahu anha wardaha, our mother who was very uh, intellectual, mashallah may Allah bless her, 
and grant her of the highest ranks of paradise. She asked the Prophet wasallam, can we eat this food from them? They're new Muslims, they might not understand the rulings of the Biha, right? So what did the Prophet do? Did he start grilling them the way we do? Ya Akhi, how was this? What did you do? Which way was the knife? Who did it? What's your name? What's your parents' name? When did you enter Islam? Shahada, okay, what is the five pillars? What? No, he told Aisha, they are Muslims. Say Bismillah and eat it. Default ruling, if it's given to you by a Muslim, Bismillah and eat that. Now I know we have that big debate here about stunned and unstunned. That's a scholarly debate, mashallah. If you are up on those scholarly debates and choose that based on scholarly references, may Allah bless you. But if you're a layman and you don't know no better, and the sign on the outside says halal, guess what it's halal for you. If it doesn't end up being halal, that's on the owner and whoever put the sign up and whoever killed the meat, yes, that's on them. For you it's halal. For you it's halal. Just like I'm trying to explain to our youth, and they cannot wrap their head around this when it comes to fiqh, that there can be two opposing opinions about a matter from the ulama, and they're both right. <laughs> Did you know that's possible? You can go to a, a scholar about an issue, and he can tell you that based on my ijtihad, this is haram. You can go to another scholar, and we don't, shouldn't do this, this is fatwa shopping, but you could go to another scholar, let's just say another brother goes to another scholar who asks him the exact same question, and he says, based on my ijtihad, this is halal. The person who asked the scholar and said it was haram, it's haram for them. If they trust the, 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 the person who they asked. The person who asked and got the halal, it's halal for them. So it can be both haram for you and halal for them and you both be doing the right thing. But our problem is that nope, nope, we all, you have to, you have to do what I'm doing. If you don't agree with my, you know, that's it, you're off of it. We can, we can have those understandings. So everything in your daily life is halal. Enjoy your life. Make sure though you are checking the rulings of permissibility about matters you're not sure of. Just check. Just check. But when it comes to your deen, when it comes to the way you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to your salah, when it comes to your zakah, when it comes to your hajj, when it comes to your fasting, everything is impermissible all of it everything is impermissible unless you can find evidence from the quran or the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that that is permissible the default ruling is that it's all haram because we safeguard the relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you cannot if there's something you do that you feel brings you closer to Allah or service is uh, servitude to him in some way is worship to him in some way is dhikr in some way Please, for the sake of Allah, make sure that you can find some evidence in the Qur'an or in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam or his companion's statements that say that this was done. And if not, leave it alone. Leave it alone. The Prophet wasallam said, al-umuri The word, He said, the most evil of actions are innovations. And every innovation is a bid'ah. And every bid'ah is a, is a, is a misguidance. And every single misguidance goes to hell. We have to be very, very careful about the things that we put into our religion. Be very careful. Make sure you have some sound evidence. I don't care how long you've been doing it. I don't care how long it's been done. Check these things because this is super important. Super, super important. Once I think it was, uh, it was either Ibn Abbas or Ibn Mas'ud. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember. He came into the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu And we'll wrap it up with this inshaAllah. So you can ask some questions. He came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came into the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He saw a man from the Tabi'een who were the best generation after the companions. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best generation is my generation. Thumma ladini alunuhum wa thumma ladini alunuhum. Then those who come after them and then those who come after them and he stopped. So this is the Tabi'een. They, they met and saw companions. All day, every day. He saw him doing tasbih. Tasbih. You know, subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. But the way he was counting his tasbih, I'm not making a ruling about tasbih here. I'm just giving you an example of how they saw things. He was doing it by moving rocks from one pile to the next. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. So he could keep count. The companion came to him. I don't want to... Claim it wrongly. If you suddenly you remember the story, you know, I think it was Ibn Mas'ud or uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas. I think it was Ibn Mas'ud. He came and said, Woe be to you. Woe be to you. The Prophet wasallam hasn't long left us. Like literally, his body is buried right over there. We didn't do that very long ago. And he said, and you have already left the religion. 
you've already left the religion. That to them was such a massive thing that, that the, the deen was so pure, it was so pristine, it was so perfect that adding things to it to them was tantamount to destroying its entirety, leaving it in its entirety. If they saw us now, may Allah help us. If they saw us now, may Allah help us. They, they would know that Umar ibn Khattab was right when he told the Prophet وسلم, when the verse Al Yawm Al Kamatu Lakum Dinukum was revealed. Umar was standing right there and he started crying and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, nothing comes after perfection except that which will destroy it. And the Prophet وسلم, said, You have indeed spoken the truth. That was a crying point to them that after this, this is it, this is the pinnacle. This is as good as it'll ever be. After this, it's downhill. And the Prophet وسلم, said every generation after him would be exceedingly worse. Until the last generation of humanity was the worst that had ever walked in the face of this earth. And that is who the Day of Judgment will befall upon. That's who the Day of Judgment will befall upon. May Allah protect us from ever being around during those days because there will be no Muslims left. Because one of the final signs of the Day of Judgment is the, the Dukhan. The smoke that will come and take the soul. Of anyone who has any ounce of iman in their heart, Allah will come and take them to not have to witness those times uh, on those days. But why I chose Islam is because it is everything that a human being could want or need to have a relationship with the Creator in this life and a guidance and a direction. A guidance and a direction as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that, that, that in Surah Al-Furqan that we revealed this Furqan as the criterion between right and wrong and a guidance for mankind. We have sent it as a guidance for mankind, a criteria between right and wrong and a, a proof of that guidance from Surah Al-Furqan. So we have everything that we could ever need. Everything that could ever be needed and the only thing that we have to do is live it and follow it and Enhance our lives through it enhance our lives through it. If you want to go out and be the most successful uh, uh, Engineer that's ever walked the face of this earth do that mashallah. We need them. We need we need your talents Serve the the, the world and serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever field you want to be in sports wh Whatever it is as long as it's permissible You can have the best of both you can have the best of both. Allah commanded us, And some of the best of this world is to have things, to, to enjoy your life. The Prophet ﷺ said of the best of this life, you might know what he said would be the best of this life if it was given to you. He's speaking to the brothers, by the way. It could go for the sisters as well. He said, righteous wife. He said, if Allah grants you a righteous wife, he's granted you the best of this dunya. Because anyone who's been married for long enough knows Brothers, Ikhwan, that your wife can make your life Jannah. <laughs> we'll leave that there. Um, but also he said of, 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 of this world, some of the benefits to have a spacious home, to have a big home is, is one of the beauties that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to some of his slaves. To have a big house and spacious is, is a ni'mah from Allah jalla wa ala. Enjoy it. It's these permissible things. Our youth, subhanAllah, they need us. They need us. The, 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 the youth sitting around here today are going to be the elders of tomorrow. If we want these, these edifices that we've erected in the West to still be here servicing our good deeds when we're dead in our ground and I've helped build a, a number of masajid around the world and I'm like, bro, you got to get the youth in here because I'm, I'm, and part of it is me being greedy. I want the good deeds. I want this place to still be open when I'm buried in the ground. So the good deeds can still be coming my way. If you want to see that, then we need to start putting some love in the youth for the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his religion. That is, 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 is on, on their level. Speaking their language, addressing their needs, addressing their issues, addressing the topics that they cannot get answered from anyone else. Because let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if you don't want to answer them, there are people who are going to answer their questions. And their, their answers are going to be devastating to the developing mind, body, and soul of our youth, to their faith, to their, to their heart, to their mind. We need to be tackling these issues. And that's one project that I've taken on, as me and the brother were talking on the drive here, that I've started to, started to tackle taboo issues. Because I've been around long enough to, I just don't really care anymore. <laughs> I don't care what people say about me anymore, you know, like it is what it is. I'm going to do what I feel like is going to be the most beneficial for my time and effort put in because now that I've cracked 40, uh, for those of you over 40, you realize when you crack 40, you, you start looking at time differently. You start looking at, you start quantifying time differently. 
Now it's like, how much good can I get out of this? I want to try to squeeze as much good out of this little bit of time that I might have left because I'm on the back half now. So I'm trying to do things that I think will be beneficial and, and I cannot find anything more beneficial than reaching our youth. Because at the next generation, if you guys, you older guys like me, if you take what I say, it might benefit me for another 10, 15, 20 years and they're going to put you in the ground. That's done. But these youth, if they catch on to something that I do or I say and they carry it with them for the next 40, 50, 60 years, Alhamdulillah, I mean, that's just racking up the scale. So I'm trying to, to reach our youth because they need us. They need us. I want them to be the next leaders. I want the indigenous born Muslims in the United Kingdom, in, in, in Europe, in, in Australia, in America to become the next leaders of Islam in these, in, in these places because they will take Islam farther than we can ever have imagined because they're born and raised here. They understand how everybody thinks. They understand how the system works. They understand the good, the bad, the ugly. They've seen it all. If they can hold on to their deen and become the leaders of the community, they'll do things like you and I have no capabilities of doing, insha'Allah ta'ala, but we have to, to service that. Our communities have to service that in, in a way that will be holistic to them, in a way that is going to help their life, because their life is not like your life. Their life is not like your life. I was just talking about my story about something that happened to me after becoming a Muslim on my last podcast. I don't know if any, any of you might have seen it. I have a podcast that I run on, on YouTube. It's called The Reflection Podcast. And I was talking about having to go call someone on a payphone from, from a beeper. That was my youth, you know? Somebody paged me and I need to go to a payphone. And I'm like, no, no, no. Almost none of my audience is going to have any idea what this... They can't relate to that. They can't understand that. So we need to try to make sure we speak into our youth in a language they understand, in a way that they understand, giving them the space to grow, giving them the space to make mistakes, because you made plenty of them as your youth as well. And now you're expecting that... Are you, I don't know if we are trying to make up for our misspent youth by making our children perfect, but it's not going to make up for your mistakes as a young person by trying to hold your children to perfection. You have to allow them to learn some of the same lessons you learned the hard way. Because let me tell you one thing as I wrap it up, brothers and sisters. The best lessons in life are the lessons that are learned the hard way. <laughs> Those are the ones that stick with you to the day you die. The day you die. Uh, but hopefully our youth, we can guide them to not have to learn as many hard lessons as we did. We can pass on the, the things that we've learned and the way, the way we went about things and give them a better path, inshaAllah ta'ala. So if you want to ask me why I'm a Muslim, why Islam, why not? Why not? Give me one reason why not. And that I've been asking for so many years. When people ask me, why'd you become a, why, why would you be a Muslim? Why not? Give me just one reason. Allah Jalla says, just prove one verse wrong. He doesn't even call out like, make 5,000 verses. No, just one. Just, just one. Just prove one of them wrong. Just make one chapter like the Quran, which is like what? Seven, a few words. A few words. You can't do it. So that's where I stand on my deen, is that I've done my due diligence and I've searched high and low. And Islam has always proven itself everything it's said to be. And there's nobody that's come to disprove it yet. So until someone disproves the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to be a Muslim. Insha'Allah ta'ala, as long as Allah will have me and keep me upon guidance. And I always use this as an example as I close. Um, <coughs> I used to do a lot of interfaith. I don't like the word interfaith, by the way. I don't like the premise of the word uh, at all, um, because it has a very it has a very dangerous meaning. Let's just put it that way. Um, but I've done common faith, where we have some commonality. Common faith, uh, uh, where I've been talking to Muslims, uh, Jews, and and Christians all in the same room, and. I remember we did a big one in San Diego. The first time this just popped in my mind. Because somebody asked me, how do you know your religion is true? And, and we were, it was a talk about Moses. So Muslims had come. It was organized by the Muslims, but Christians and Jews came. Uh, in, in Southern California, there's lots of the Jewish community. <clears throat> it's expensive and it's warm. That's where you find it. Um, I said, uh, how many of you believe in Moses? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. How many of you believe in Moses? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you guys too. Raise your hand if you believe in Moses. Musa. Okay. How many of you believe Moses did miracles? How many of you believe Musa did miracles? How many of you have ever witnessed with your own two eyes one of the miracles that Musa did? No? Okay. How many of you believe in Jesus? Same thing. Did he do miracles? How many of you have witnessed one of the miracles he performed in his lifetime with your own two eyes? Okay. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We believe in him. We believe he did miracles, right? 
How many of you have seen one of the miracles performed in his lifetime with your own two eyes? What is it? It's the Quran. It's still here. And that's what I told them. This book is the Quran. And until you can disprove this, then I, this is what I'm going to stand behind. I'm just going to put it in front of me and this is it. This is my defense. You got to get through this first. And they've been trying for a long time. So that's the thing is that a lot of times non-Muslims will come and, and they try to attack Islam from, from, its, from, from the low-hanging fruit. The Muslims and what we do and the weird backward things we do and the things that are against the religion and sex and this. That's low-hanging fruit. And I always, when people who are intellectual come to me with that, I say, come on. I mean, you can do better than the low-hanging fruit. I mean, a 10-year-old kid can go after low-hanging fruit. Why don't you go at the root? The Qur'an. How about we have a talk on that? Qur'an versus Bible, Qur'an versus Torah, Qur'an... Put them, stack them side by side, and, and let's see where we end up. When you look at it that way, the root is so strong. This big, beautiful tree of this deen is, is supported by, by that root, by that root, the Qur'an. So please attach your children to that book. Not just verbatim recitation. We have lots of hafaz running around that can recite the Qur'an and make us all cry in the month of Ramadan and they have no idea what they're saying. So it's not helpful to them. It's not helpful to them. I remember uh, Sheikh Haytham, mashallah. I spent a few days with him in Norway in the same flat uh, at a conference. It was the three most nerve-wracking days of my life. Because it was just me and him. Yeah, it was very intimidating and I didn't know him as well back then. And, and by the way, uh, he, you know how we snore in our sleep and talk? Sheikh Haytham recites Quran in his sleep. I'm a witness to this. Um, next level. We're babbling about nonsense. He recites Quran. He told me, he said, Yusha, judge your relationship with Allah based on your relationship with this book. He said, that's, that's your relationship with Allah. He said, if your relationship with the Quran is strong, you'll find that your relationship with Allah is strong. And if your relationship with the Quran becomes weak, your faith will become weak and it, and it can be targeted. And when he said that, it reminded me of something Shaykh Abdullah Ashanqiti, Hafidullah Ta'ala, if any of you know him, he is the Mufassir of Medina to this day. He is the scholar of the Qur'an in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu We used to sit with him after Fajr and he would give tafsir of the verses that were recited at Salat al-Fajr. And one morning he said that the Qur'an is the only connection you have to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Without it, we would be done. And I asked him, Politely, but I wanted to know because I was going to use that. But I need to, I need before I can use this, I need to dig a bit deeper. I said, Isn't our connection to Allah through our salah? Because the word salah comes from the word sila, means connection. He smiled and he said, Yes, but which one of the five mandatory salawat that Allah has ordered you to pray can you pray without the Quran? He said, One of the pillars, one of the arkan of the Salah is that it must contain the recitation of the Book of Allah or is invalid. This is one of the pillars upon which Salah stands is the Qur'an. I said, SubhanAllah. So he said, without the Qur'an you have nothing. You don't even know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. You know nothing about him. He said, so this is all you have. So we need to make our youth understand this. That do not lose this. You can lose so many things and come back from them. But if you lose, the, if we lose the Qur'an, we're done for. It's, it's over. It's all gone. The game is over. Everything. Because we lose our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I say the Qur'an, I equate it with the sunnah. To me, they are the same thing. And to the scholars of the ulama of our past, they were equivalent. What I mean by sunnah is verified, authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that there's no question about its authenticity. That is wahi. That is revelation. And Allah said it. We revealed to you. And you reveal to them like what he's Allah says what he says is revelation revealed. So they're the same. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I was sent with the Quran and that which is equal to it. He said, I give you the Quran and the Sunnah. If you hold fast to them, you will never go astray. So these two things are equal. Attach our youth to these things, please. Please attach our youth to them and attach our youth to the stories of their predecessors. Attach them to the stories of Umar ibn al-Khattab, of Abu Bakr al-Sadiq, of Abdurrahman ibn Awf, of Musab ibn Humair, of Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah. Attach our sisters to the stories of Umm Salama, of Khadija, of Aisha, of Zainab, all of these, so that they can realize that these celebrities that they see now are nothing. They might be cool to, you know, watch, and, but in reality, when it comes to taking an example from them, they've got nothing on these people. They have nothing on these great giants whom we follow in their footsteps, whom Allah said about them, that He was pleased with them. 
and they were pleased with him. Of whom many of the Prophet ﷺ promised them the ranks of paradise while they were alive in this life. So we need to look at them, at their example, because the Prophet ﷺ said, as long as you follow my guidance and the guidance of the Khulafa al-Rashidin who come after me, which is four generations, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, then that, that, that took a period of years to happen. He said, you'll be rightly guided. So we need to give our youth these examples, inshaAllah. Don't name your son Umar without telling him who Umar is. So he can understand, you know, to, to, to take that example. Because that's who we take our example from. The same, don't name your daughters Fatima and not tell her who Fatima is in, in, in the examples to be followed, inshaAllah ta'ala. Khair, it was a pleasure to be with you guys here in, in High Wickham, inshaAllah ta'ala. I look forward to being able to do it again in the future, inshaAllah. I don't see myself ever going back to traveling on the level I used to, because I realize how much time I kind of was spinning my wheels wasting uh, where I could do a lot of things online so but I will continue to travel but for our youth for those of you who, who like watching streaming and stuff like that I know all of our youth are streaming today as the brother said before I stream on YouTube three times a week 30 minutes is a reminder we always do a heartfelt reminder that gets recorded during the live stream and then uploaded as a separate video and then the last half of the stream we might be playing uh, a, a few video games that I played that I feel comfortable playing without the nudity, without the swearing, without the, all the crazy stuff or we might just be talking about tech or gaming or cars or, or something like that but we have a proper gaming stream if you haven't checked it out we have a proper dedicated discord server called the Muslim Gamers League with over 5,000 youth who are on there that is a, a, a space where our youth can come and, and, and feel safe to be a Muslim but also also express their interests and their hobbies. It's all ran by youth. The designer is 15 years old. The coding uh, designer is 17 years old. It, all of my moderators are under 25 years old. Uh, there's a segregated sister section where we actually have a, a sister who, who verifies every single sister account that gets made and verifies them to go over into the sisters only side. No brothers can go over there. Uh, you, you, you're not, you don't even have the permission and if you do get found over there you get instantly banned. And we have bots and everything running so we've created a community that's pandemic proof. You know, a community where if the whole world goes locked down, we still hanging out. We still chilling. You know, there's many of us that 15, 20 of us brothers from California, from New York, from London, from Australia, we get together at night and we're just chatting and talking. We might play a game together. We're in a Discord voice room together and we're just hanging out. It doesn't matter. The world could be falling apart outside, you know, but we're still going to keep our jama'ah, inshaAllah ta'ala, to the best of our, our abilities because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, stick to the jama'ah. If you want to stay safe, stick to the jama'ah because your safety lies with the congregation, the community, the, the bond that we have. And I've realized how quickly that bond can be severed physically. Uh, so we're trying to create something that's a little bit uh, uh, proof, uh, pandemic proof, so our youth don't get locked down again and have nowhere to go to, to express themselves and to commune with Muslims and to uh, have fun with other Muslims, inshaAllah. So you guys can check that out on youtube.com slash and all the links are there, inshaAllah.